Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with another classic pay-per-view review as nominated by my Patreon backers. This week, I wanted to get one more Survivor Series review under my belt before the year was out. I know it's not November anymore, so Survivor Series month is now in the rear view, but I just want to get this one in here before it was too late. It's Survivor Series 1997. This, of course, this year is the 20th anniversary of this show, nominated on by Wesley Landon Woolsey. Wesley, thanks so much for the nomination. November 9th, 1997, the Molson Center in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. It's the 11th Survivor Series in history, the first one to be held in Canada. More than 20,500 people are in attendance for this show. Of course, everyone knows the big thing, the big thing that this show is remembered for, obviously, is the entering debut of Steve Blackman. Oh yeah, and the Montreal screw job as well. The tagline for this year's Survivor Series is Gang Rule. So really, it's the epitome of what they were pushing at the time, where everyone was in a stable or a faction or some kind of group. And really, they went a whole hog with this concept in this, in this show, because ironically, with the exception of Los was every possible stable and faction is represented in this show. You've got the Heart Foundation, DOA, the Truth Commission, the Nation, Degeneration X, of course, it was officially named at this point. So yeah, lots of groups and factions were on display on this show. Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler are on commentary. At the beginning of the show, they cut over to the uh, Spanish announce team, who you don't hear at all, and the French announcers, who you can barely hear before the show begins. And because it's French Canada, they have a French ring announcer, which I don't believe they've ever done before or since then. It was really cool to have that experience of watching it and seeing like at least the ring announcer was being delivered in a the ring announcer was being delivered in a different language than what we're used to. The first match of the evening is the first of four Survivor Series matches for the night. You've got the New Age Outlaws and the Godwins taking on the Headbangers and the New Blackjacks. Now earlier this year, Jay Biggs and I reviewed Bad Blood 97, which took place one month before this show. At that show, the Headbangers had just become the tag team champions. So between Bad Blood and Survivor Series, the Headbangers lost the belts to the Godwins, who then lost the belts to the Legion of Doom, who we'll be seeing later on, but wow, crazy the tag titles would jump around that much in just a little a less than 30 day span. Also, this is the pay-per-view debut of Road Dogg and Billy Gunn as a tag team. They only recently began teaming up at this point, only a few weeks ago, so really cool to see the beginning stages of what would go on to become one of the most popular tag teams in company history, definitely for the late 90s, and one of my personal favorite tag teams growing up. Also, I wanted to issue a little correction, because in my last review of Survivor Series 95, I questioned why Henry Godwin was there, but not Phineas, and a lot of fans reminded me in the comments section that it was because Phineas didn't debut for the company until early 96. So well after Survivor Series 95 is when Phineas showed up. So that actually confused me because I just always assumed, oh, the Godwins were just a team together. They, they poofed into being together as a tag team. I didn't, I, I wouldn't have expected that Henry Godwin, one hog farmer would have showed up, then another hog farmer shows up later on to team with them. I was assumed they were just kind of a package deal. So my bad. The crowd in Montreal was very raucous the whole time. It was one of the probably the loudest, most boisterous crowds I've heard in quite some time on a classic show here and certainly one of the most loudest crowds I've heard uh, recently just watching wrestling in general. They booed the hell out of Billy Gunn every time he was in the ring for this match or even when he was remotely involved in the match. People wanted to boo the hell out of Billy. Multiple faggot chants toward Billy Gunn here, but hey, that's late 90s for you. The LOD's shoulder pads. Hey, wait. Considering everyone who's involved in this match, with the exception of Blackjack Wyndham, Barry Wyndham, the amount of like chain wrestling and mat wrestling I saw in this match was kind of crazy to watch. Because at one point you see Blackjack Bradshaw, the future WWE champion, take Henry Godwin into an abdominal stretch and follow up the pinning combination to eliminate Henry, which I've never seen Bradshaw do a move like that before. Then later you have Thrasher and Phineas doing chain wrestling, which absolutely blew my mind. At one point, Gunn distracts Bradshaw, Road Dog rolls up Bradshaw. Uh, he kicks out just before three from the looks of it, but he gets right up and just clotheslines the fuck out of the road dog with this huge uh, lariat. And then the referee says, no, you're eliminated. You have to go. That's a pretty debatable three count. If you look back on it, it looked not that clean. Bradshaw was definitely in the process of kicking out before the three count there. So I don't know if that was planned or not, but it was definitely sloppy. And then at the end, Thrasher's all by himself against the outlaws. Thrasher counters a pump handle slam by road dog into a pinning combination. Billy Gunn goes from the top rope and hits a leg drop, or at least he would have hit the leg drop, but he was well the hell off. Like the hard cam angle was very damning because it shows he's at least one or two feet off the mark and but Thrasher sells it anyway because hey Gunn's not going back up there to do it again so then he covers up Thrasher to win the match the outlaws are the two survivors of their team they win I'm going to give this match one star uh, the match was getting clunky near the end and it didn't get much better by the end of it it wasn't that great to begin with but it was still cool to see the outlaws in the in their infancy as it would seem or as more of it all might call it embryonic 
we have our next Survivor Series matchup as the DOA, Crush, Chains, Skull, and 8-Ball take on the Truth Commission, the Interrogator, Sniper, Recon, and the Jackal. Uh, the Truth Commission, and this is something that just totally, I totally missed out on, because by the time I started watching wrestling, the Truth Commission was like there, and it was gone. They existed pretty much only in 1997. It was like based on, this was supposed to be like a South African white separatist gimmick. Their name was based on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was, I did some research on this, it was a restorative justice group that was formed formed after the abolition of apartheid in South Africa in 1994. So from what I researched about what the TRC was, sounds like it's a lot different than what the Truth Commission in the WWF was. The only similarity between the two is their name. Uh, Recon is the future Bull Buchanan, aka B Squared. He would be going, he would go on to become the bodyguard for John Cena at one point. Uh, the Interrogator was the future Kurgan and also Frankenstein in Monster Brawl. Sniper, I did do some research to figure who the hell Sniper was. His name is Luke Poyer, who was a French Canadian wrestler. Then you've got other members through the history, the, the very brief history of the Truth Commission, you did have some revolving revolving doors and some rotation in their roster, because at one point, uh, the, the manager, the Jackal, is here in this match. He was not the first manager of the Truth Commission. It was originally a guy named the Commandant, who was like a legitimate South African, who was a wrestling manager as well. And then you had a member of the group named Tank, who was the former Mantar. So definitely some of the who's who of who are they in the Truth Commission, with the exception of Kurgan and, and uh, Recon. The announcers really can't stop gushing about the interrogator. Of all the people, like he's the most intimidating physical force, certainly on the Truth Commission and probably in the whole match as well. Seems to me they were really trying to put a lot of eggs into the Kurgan basket here, really trying to push him as this next big star. Obviously, they didn't pan out, but he was definitely given a lot of hyping up in this match. And this is a very one dimensional match. I'm pretty sure almost every elimination in this match was some variation of a sidewalk slam. Like everybody got eliminated with a sidewalk slam. Kurgan hit two or three of them alone. Uh, the Jackal tags in at one point, hits a nice looking knee drop from the top rope which I was very surprised to see like the manager get in there not only get in there and wrestle but also competently for as little as he was in there he does the knee drop but then I don't know if it was crush, a skull or eight ball one of the twins gets right up and slams Jackal to eliminate him so Crush is the last one standing on his team he takes down Sniper with a sidewalk slam then immediately he gets up and Kurgan hits him with a sidewalk slam for the match to end so Kurgan is the sole survivor Ugh, this match was kind of hard to watch it was just a repetitive hostile matchup I give it one star out of four it was cool to see the Jackal uh for a very fleeting moment doing you know actually working like we're jumping up in the air and doing some nice moves the one move he did actually the truth commission as we know it was dissolved not too long after this kurgan would eventually split up from the other two i believe uh recon and sniper were involved in the tag team battle royal at wrestlemania 14 that's the pretty much the last we saw of the truth commission there uh kurgan would eventually be repackaged and be part of the oddities with the giant silva and golga the former earthquake and luna vachon in my opinion the oddities was a very underrated stable they were very over for their time i don't think they get enough love these days. The Jackal would, in 1998, he would bring in Bradshaw and Farouk. He'd bring them together to form the Acolytes. He was the person who brought Bradshaw and Farouk together for that tag team. Then, like, immediately afterward, you never saw him again. He was gone from the company shortly after the Acolytes formed, and the Acolytes would become part of the Ministry of Darkness with The Undertaker. So, uh, very interesting to see Jackal be kind of this footnote in the history of what would become the APA and all that stuff. And, of course, the Jackal would appear in ECW not long after this as Cyrus the Virus, who would play the network representative during ECW's time on TNN. Our next Survivor Series matchup is Team USA, Vader, Goldust, Mark Marrow, and the debuting Steve Blackman. This is his first match in the WWF taking on Team Canada. That's Jim Neidhart, the British Bulldog, Doug Furness, and Phil LaFon. There is exactly one Canadian in that entire Canada team. Uh, everyone else is either American or English in the case of the British Bulldog. And you know what? The USA team, not much less of a motley looking crew either, because it is a weird goulash of guys in Team USA. I found out that apparently the Patriot was supposed to be captaining this team. They play his music when they make their entrance, but then he tore his tricep muscle a few weeks before the show, so Steve Blackman was his replacement. So that, I think, is a big reason as to why this team looks so damn weird. Also, because it's the USA and Canada, the crowd obviously is pro-team Canada, even though they're predominantly heels here. Although, to be honest, the babyface team or the American team does not seem that much babyface at all to me either, because Mark Merrow is starting to do his thing where he's like getting jealous of Sable's success and attention. And then, of course, Goldust had just recently like split on air with uh, Marlena, and so he walked out and his wife and kids in, so he's kind of doing heelish things there. So, uh, yeah, not a very good face team here. So it makes sense that they're going to get booed, not only because they're American, but also because a couple of them are actually heels. Let's talk about those pre-match promos each team had. They were not good. Uh, Vader, I was, I don't know what was going on with Vader. I don't think he even knew where he was going with it. And Doug Furness on Team Canada was not much better. The team you've assembled here really doesn't even seem to have a common threat. We don't have very much in common. 
except we don't like big mouth Canadians. I'll tell you what the American fans of WWF are about. They're about drug, crimes, slime, and now they have their new degenerates. Some highs of this matchup. First of all, the, the strength of the British Bulldog to put Vader up in a vertical suplex like that, even for a little bit, was pretty impressive. Like, you saw like Ahmed Johnson in Survivor Series 95, how he body slammed Yokozuna and it was barely getting him off the ground. Then you've got Bulldog who puts Vader up and Vader posts and is like straight as an arrow, comes right up there and it just looks so impressive to see Bulldog pick up Vader like that. I love that suplex, as brief as it was. Then Steve Blackman gets in the ring for a little bit. I would probably rate this debut in ring performance for him as like a C grade because, you know, the moves themselves that he did looked good. They were crisp. They connected. But I think that at first he was rushing, I think, way too much. I know his offense is supposed to be fast and quick, but he was just going spot, 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 spot. Like he didn't let anything breathe or really kind of take take a hold for the fans. And also he did not connect once with the fans. I mean, Steve Blackman was never really known for being a ball of charisma, even in his prime as he got more success as the hardcore champion in, in 2000. But he was really bad here. Like he, his, I think his eyes were downcast for most of, the, most of the match. He was like watching his feet, trying to make sure he was in the right spot. And that part wasn't very good. So he wasn't in there for very long though because he eventually gets eliminated via count out when he goes outside the ring and fights the can connection and Jim Neidhart joins the fray. Vader's working very valiantly in this matchup. He does the bulk of the work for his team which is kind of ironic given his size. Obviously he has the cardio to pull it off but it was still kind of surprising. At one point he hits Jim Neidhart with this very weird looking elbow drop. I've never seen it hit like this. He hits Jim Neidhart like in the groin and the lower abdomen. I've never seen that before because usually you know you can do it where you grab the guy's leg then you come down with like what's is basically an elbow drop on the bend of the knee to work the leg or if you're doing a regular elbow drop your body is parallel to theirs and you come down like that but this is the first time I've ever seen someone like lined right up with somebody's body and doing an elbow drop basically in the goods that was very surprising to see I kind of want to see someone do that now <laughs> in, in modern times gold dust is a like very freshly healed now because he's turned his back on his wife and child he's also wrestling with a broken hand he never does anything in this matchup he keeps avoiding the tag he gets off the apron he turns around he wants no part of this match until at one point Vader slaps Goldust in the face, which does count as a tag. And so then Goldust is legal, but he just walks out and gets counted out. Even though the fans hate Team USA, they're still booing Goldust over this because of his cowardice. Like even Vader gets sympathy in this match for the fact that he's been left high and dry by his partner. The match ends when Vader splats Doug Furness with the Vader bomb. And then as that's happening, as the referee's trying to roll out Doug Furness, British Bulldog hits Vader with the ring bell from behind uh, at the back of the head. Apparently neither ref sees this spot. And so Bulldog pins Vader to win the match for his team. He is the sole survivor. I give this match one and a half stars out of four. I thought Vader looked like a million bucks here. I never would have expected him to carry such a huge load in this match, but uh, you know, surprised the hell out of me. Bulldog was also impressive with the stuff he did as well, and Doug Furness, I think, was also carrying a lot of the work as well for Team Canada. He and Bulldog were definitely there the longest in-ring uh, competitors out of that team. Blackman's debut was what it was. It was okay, but not spectacular, and then I liked the story they were telling with the gold dust, but beyond that, nothing really impressed me about this match. We go to the announced desk where we see Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler try and say Super Supper Sweepstakes. Bear with me now. The Super I can say supper it. I can say it. The the, what? Go ahead. Super, the Super Supper Supper. Super Supper Sweepstakes. You go. That's close enough. Apparently, Milton Bradley, who sponsored the show, put on a contest where the winner has like 10 of their friends and them have a meal with a wrestler of their choice. Uh, they do a live call-in with the winner of the contest. I'm kind of surprised that this segment stayed on the network, to be perfectly honest. They're, they're talking with the, the winner, and she's very flustered. Her name is Jacqueline from South Carolina. She's very excited at everything. And I love uh, what happens when Jim Ross asks her, uh, who, what, what wrestler do you want to have a, a meal with? Don't call Steve Austin. <laughs> Stone Cold Steve Austin is going to be your guest. Well, that's interesting. Stone Cold Steve Austin? What about me? Up next, our first singles match of the night is Kane taking on Mankind. Of course, Kane debuted the previous month at Bad Blood 97 when he cost Undertaker the Hell in a Cell match. This is his first official match as Kane, even though we'd seen him uh, in the weeks before this doing a bunch of like beatdowns, uh, post-match stuff, but he was never an official match until now. One of his victims was Dude Love. Now, the reason uh, Mick Foley was Dude Love at this point was because he revealed the Dude Love character at SummerSlam 97 in the middle of his cage match with Triple H. He was supposed to rip off his, his Mankind shirt to reveal a big heart on his chest, but like, due to the sweat that he had in the match, it was kind of runny and smudgy. Didn't quite have the same uh, moment it was supposed to be, but he was dude love after SummerSlam 97. So he gets beat up by Kane here in the weeks leading up to this, which causes him to become Mankind again. Mankind is unleashed once again on the World Wrestling Federation, and he is after Kane, and especially Paul Bear, who he felt betrayed by, because of course Paul Bear used to 
to manage mankind for a bit. And so now he says he wants to put his fingers into Paul's trembling flabby jowls. You can tell that this is really early in Kane's run because the fans don't know how to spell his name yet. They show a pretty prominently, they show a couple of signs in the audience where they don't quite have the name spelled right. The first one is the biblical spelling of Kane, which makes sense. But then like at the end of the match, you see a sign where they spell it K-A-I-N, like, ooh, so close. Anyway, this match, you know, it's not technical. It's a big brawl. You can come to expect that because Kane's a big, like, walking monster zombie creature. And then you've got Mankind who just lives to take punishment. At one point, Kane throws the steps right into Mankind's face. There's a tiny botch here where Kane's looking to throw Mankind, like, into the corner. But Mick Foley just kind of gets up and rolls into the ring. So he's like, you see Kane's just really able to follow through. Just a tiny botch there. As the match goes on, I'm beginning to realize this is probably a no-DQ match because, like, nothing's getting called here. There's, like, the stair spot from earlier. There's, like, a chair shot to the face. And there's, like, a low blow later on. Like, nothing gets called here. So it's clear it's no DQ. Mankind gets some offense on Kane, hits him with a pile driver. And while Kane is down, he puts the man level claw onto Paul Bear. Kane sits up and then choke slams Mankind off the apron into the announce table right behind him. And Jesus, what a bump. Like, Mick took all that, like, right on his back. Very, just, like, trust fall. The story here, though, is that Mankind keeps fighting. He keeps wanting to take down Kane because in that pre-match promo, he said he'd keep running into the wall until it came down. And that's exactly what he's doing. He just keeps fighting, keeps getting up. He hits a low blow and a DDT on a cane on the floor. The Cactus Jack elbow drop off the apron onto the floor. Then Mankind gets up onto the top rope. Kane gets up and then just pretty much beals him right onto the floor. Like, Jesus, what a drop that was. That looks more painful than the elbow drop onto the floor from the apron. And so Mankind is able to crawl back into the ring, still fighting, still wanting to get a piece of Kane, but Kane hits him with a tombstone, wins the match. I give this one two and a half stars. The stuff these two did to each other was ridiculous. For an official debut match for Kane, you can't really ask for much more than this. Like, he took punishment, but he, you know, it was in character, still getting up and still showing the imperviousness to pain that we would see later on in his WrestleMania match with The Undertaker, where he kept kicking out of all those tombstones. We get an eerily prophetic interview backstage with Michael Cole talking to Sergeant Slaughter and Vince McMahon. Uh, Slaughter says there's all this increased security now backstage uh, regarding Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart, and they're going to make sure the match happens. Then Michael Cole asks Vince point blank, I'm going to put you on the hot seat now. Who's going to win? I don't know. The final Survivor Series match of the night, you've got the Nation of Domination. Farouk, Rocky Maivia, Kama, and friend of the show, D'Lo Brown, taking on Ken Shamrock, Ahmed Johnson, and the current tag team champions, the Legion of Doom. Of course, Ahmed Johnson had a lot of beef with Farouk and the Nation leading up to this point. Uh, and then you've got Shamrock feuding with The Rock at this point as well. Uh, and let's talk about the backstage promo. Again, uh, I don't know what's in the water in Montreal. Maybe they're drinking a lot of Molson in the Molson Center because you know, these promos backstage have not been good and Hawks is not better than anyone else's. <laughs> Get done with you, you'll all be down, face down in a pool of blood, hoping you got a friend to tip you on your back so you don't drown in your own blood. This is my favorite spot in the match. Within the first minute, D'Lo hits a pile driver on a hawk who no sells it, so that's great psychology there. Then the rock comes in, a hawk is hit from behind by Kama, the rock hits the rock bottom, and Hawk is eliminated. Then later on, Ahmed Johnson hits the Pearl River plunge onto Farouk. So Farouk is gone, but he still hangs out outside the ring for a bit. He trips up Ahmed Johnson and, and holds his foot down while the rock pins him, so Ahmed's eliminated. And this is right in front of the referee, too. Like the referee sees it, is trying to separate Farouk from Ahmed's foot, but that doesn't happen. So again, the the, the, the officiating in Survivor Series matches to me always feels a little wonky because in that situation what would happen? Would you disqualify The Rock because Farouk was trying to help him out? I don't even know how that really works but I guess with Survivor Series matches you play kind of fast and loose with the rules. The New Age Outlaws show up again to make fun of the LOD. This time uh, Billy Gunn is wearing animals face paint. Road Dog is wearing a set of shoulder pads that they stole from the LOD a week or two before on Raw. Uh, they throw salt into Animal's eyes. He's blinded. He is counted out. Uh, the New Age Outlaws would very soon after this beat the LOD to become the new tag team champions. So the revolving door of tag champs continues within the span of like a month and a half. It's Headbangers, Godwins, LOD, New Age Outlaws. It's down to two on one, D'Lo and The Rock against Shamrock. Ken is able to make D'Lo tap with the ankle lock. Rock hits Ken with the chair, but uh, Ken kicks out of that. Shamrock takes down The Rock and puts him in the ankle lock for uh, Rock to submit. So Shamrock is the sole survivor here. Three of the four Survivor Series matchups ended with sole survivors. You had Kurgan, The Bulldog, and now Ken Shamrock. I'm gonna give this match two stars out of four. Out of all these Survivor Series matchups on this night, this one was probably the best one of the bunch. Still not amazing, but it's still better than the other ones we had seen so far at this point. Uh, the Rock and Shamrock would continue their feud well into 1998. They would fight at WrestleMania 14 for the Intercontinental Championship, and then again in the finals of the King of the Ring Tournament, which Shamrock would win that match. So that was pretty much like the big blow off their feud. They would occasionally fight after that, but not at the level they were doing before that.
Intercontinental Championship match as Owen Hart, who won the belt last month in a tournament at Bad Blood, takes on Steve Austin, the man who helped him win the belt at Bad Blood. This is, of course, as Austin's first match back since that scary Nick injury at SummerSlam 97 at the hands of Owen Hart due to that scary sit-out pile driver that was botched. So this is Austin's first match back. In kayfabe, he was not cleared to wrestle. He had to sign a hold harmless agreement in order to be able to wrestle Owen here. And Owen is definitely gung-ho about re-injuring Austin's neck. He's even wearing the Owen 316 says, I just broke your neck shirt, which I'm kind of amazed they never turn that into an actual piece of merchandise. It's classic heel heat. Austin gets the cool broken glass entrance for his intro, but it doesn't break all the way, so he has to kind of like go around it and kind of push some of the glass out of the way. They show a shot of the Canadian flag as Owen Hart's making his way out there with Team Canada. And what the hell is going on with this sign right next to the flag? That is some weird, I don't know what the hell that's supposed to be. Team Canada disperses after Austin hits Jim Neidhart with a stunner early on. They do tease the pile driver at the beginning of the match, and the crowd is all for it. They definitely want to see Austin get his neck broke again, which is pretty sick, but hey, there's that. That partisan Canada crowd for you. It's a big brawl here in this matchup. I think Austin's very well protected in this environment. He's not taking really any major bumps, and so they're pretty much just doing a whole lot of fighting outside. They finally get in the ring, and Austin hits this random tilt-a-whirl on Owen. I guess it's not that random because it is kind of a callback to SummerSlam 97. That was a tilt-a-whirl that Owen did just before putting Austin in the pile driver. Puts him back down on his feet, hits him with the stunner, wins the match. Austin is your new Intercontinental Champion in a pretty short and sweet match. I'm going to give this one one and a half stars. The match itself, not a whole lot to speak of, but the story of Austin's return and coming back and uh, reclaiming the championship that he won at SummerSlam 97 that had to give up, that was pretty cool to see. Austin would go on to feud with The Rock over the championship for the next couple of months, then that would lead into the Royal Rumble, where Austin would win the Royal Rumble match, then of course would help lead the company into the promised land when he wins at WrestleMania 14, beating Shawn Michaels for the world title. And speaking of the world title, it's time for the main event. It's Bret Hart defending the championship against Shawn Michaels. Of course, this is the culmination of a very long rivalry these guys have had in the ring and behind the scenes. A lot of personal animosity bleeding into this storyline as well. They had a match at WrestleMania 12, the Iron Man match, and the agreement was apparently that Shawn was supposed to help give Bret the win back at WrestleMania 13, but Shawn wanted no part of it. He didn't want to put Bret over, and that uh, drove more of a wedge between these two guys. There's the Sunny Days promo. They had a real-life brawl in the backstage after that fact, and so yeah, a lot of personal bad blood between these two that made, I think, the few in a way made the feud even better but it also makes it I think one of the greatest rivalries of all time because it's one of those few feuds that has so much bad blood in it but it doesn't uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't lead to a detriment of match quality they still put on great work and they, even though they hate each other I think that's what makes it one of the better rivalries I can think of the first half of this match really isn't the match it's actually a bunch of stuff before the bell officially rings these two are just brawling and beating the piss out of each other up and down ringside area into the crowd up the ramp back down the ramp you name it they are there and they are fighting each other. It is pretty wild and crazy. Even Vincent Mann comes out and is trying to beg and implore these guys to just get in the ring and have this damn match. So it's really, again, more of that kind of like blurring the lines. What's real? What's kayfabe? As they're trying to get this match done and get started. Even when the match begins, there isn't a whole lot of technical proficiency in this match. It's mostly still more brawling in and out of the ring. There is some rare mat wrestling peppered in here, but for the most part, it's just a bunch of punches and the occasional slam and stuff. Uh, there is a point where Brett gets uh, the figure four on Sean wrapped around the turnbuckle post, and I love that move. When it's done right, it looks beautiful. When it's not done right, like it did at Bad Blood 97, when Brett had it on the Patriot, it looks terrible and shitty, and I don't want to see it ever again. But here, it looks great here, and just Sean selling the leg, is he's great at selling here. I love the agony on Sean's face and the way he's trying to fight his way and just do everything he can to get his way out of the figure four in the middle of the ring. There's a big old ref bump near the end when Sean pulls Hebner into the way, and so he takes a big spill, and we all know what comes comes next, folks. Sean grabs uh, Brett, puts him in the sharpshooter. Earl Hebner gets back up, and within seconds of the move being locked in, Earl Hebner, at the uh, request, the urging, the screaming of Vincent Mann, rings the bell. The match is over. Sean is declared the new champion. Sean does a very good job pretending to be pissed off. Brett spits in Vince's face. Sean storms away, and that's the Montreal screw job. So by all accounts, the match was supposed to end. It was planned to end in a big old schmoz DQ finish with Jim Neidhart and Davey Boy running out. They were in grill position ready to, for their cue, but then that thing happens and it, it, nobody knows what to do. So few people were in the loop on this. Apparently it was just Vince and like Gerald Briscoe and Shawn Michaels and that was pretty much it. Shawn, of course, denied up and down for years that he, he knew about the screw job, but then on an episode of Confidential, he finally admitted that he, he was in the know the whole time.
time. So many people have talked about this and written about this. I, 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 I never wanted to do like a full review about the screw job. This is probably the most I'm going to talk about the Montreal screw job here. Did the screw job need to happen? Couldn't it have ended in a schmoz? You know, I say no to that question. You know, I believe Brett and Eric Bischoff when they say they weren't planning on taking the belt with them to WCW, but you know, even if they didn't do that, it would have looked really bad for the event to end in a big old DQ finish. Then the next night, Brett hands the belt up and leaves for the competition. That's almost as bad as like taking the belt with you to their company because you might as well be throwing it in the dumpster. Brett, I think, could have dropped the belt sometime before Survivor Series, but that would have probably not been a good move either because fans in Montreal paid to see Brett and Sean. That's what the whole pay-per-view was centered around was Brett and Sean. And if you kind of, and if you ruin that, if you take that away from them or give it to them early before the pay-per-view, that would just be terrible business because what possible solution, what, what alternate could you have done in, in an alternate universe if Bret Hart dropped the belt to Shawn Michaels before Survivor Series and then he left and you have Shawn Michaels taking on who? Who could have, have wrestled him and had a match with as much heat behind it as Bret Hart. You wouldn't have been able to do that. So like, ultimately, I, I don't like what Vincent Mann did, but I understand why he did it. So I'm going to give this match three and a half stars. Easily the best match of the show, but with the heat behind it and the talent behind it, really, is there any question it's the best match of the night? A very physical, intense battle done very well. Like I said, the personal animosity here between these guys makes everything feel more real, and the passion between these two is clearly there. You know, even if you try to remove the shady aspect of how the match ended, which is very hard to do, uh, I think it's still a very entertaining match. It is impossible. It's impossible to wipe away the stain of the Montreal screw job from this match as as good as the match itself was. Of course, you know, after this, the aftermath, Sean would briefly feud with Ken Shamrock over the title at, D at the D-Generation X pay-per-view the next month. Then he would fight The Undertaker at the Royal Rumble. He would injure his back and be forced into an early temporary retirement where he would drop the belt to Steve Austin at WrestleMania. We wouldn't see him again until 2002. And then, of course, Bret Hart. Of course, he, as I've talked about in my Bret Hart and WCW episode of the show, which you can check that out if you want more information, he would leave the company, go to WCW in December, be involved in the Star Cave Men event, that was really weird. And then he would have a very up and down career there, winning a couple more world titles before he had to retire due to a massive concussion. And then, of course, Vincent Mann, the man who said, ring the bell, ring the fucking bell, would go on to become Mr. McMahon as a result of this huge moment of the Montreal screw job, officially making him the, one of the top villains of the company. And they would even recreate this finish one year later at Survivor Series 98 in the Deadly Game Tournament when The Rock turned on the fans and joined the corporation and became the new world champion after screwing over mankind. They would milk this moment moment for literally another decade plus, almost two decades. That's how big this moment was. And then, of course, to wrap the story up in a nice little bow, Brett would return to the company in 2010. He and Sean would publicly bury the hatchet on an episode of Raw that year, and then he would later be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And so, and since then, he actually wrestled a couple of matches, if you will, in 2010. Once was against Vincent Mann at WrestleMania, then the other one was against The Miz for the U.S. Championship, which he actually won. My final grade for Survivor Series 1997 is a C plus. Much like Bad Blood the previous month, this show is pretty much a one match card. And even though it was a great match, even if you remove the screw job aspect of it, it wasn't enough to really buoy the rest of the card. I mean, that match was good, and I think that Kane and Mankind was the most entertaining thing on the show besides Brett and Sean. But besides that, you have two of the four Survivor Series matches which weren't very good. And you got Austin and Owen was kind of a nothing match, even though it told like a good story. Still kind of like a nothing match in the grand scheme of things. Really, the whole thing this show is known for is the Montreal screw job. That's what everybody remembers. So it puts a whole damper, kind of this wet blanket, on everything. Even if it were a great show from top to bottom, the Montreal screw job, I think, would have taken it down a notch from there. It's really impossible to remove that from this show because it defined this show. So what do you guys think of Survivor Series 97? Let me know in the comments section below. Thanks once again to Patreon backer Wesley for nominating this show for me to review. If you want to play a role in what shows I review in the future, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, Go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you will have the ability to nominate classic pay-per-views for me to review on this channel in the future. Next time on the classic pay-per-view reviews, folks, it's December. You know where this is going. It's ECW, December to Dismember, 2006. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.